unbothered. Uh, uh, stats show in the United States, um, almost half of adults, 46.4%, uh, they say, will experience a mental illness during their lifetime. 5% of those same adults, they say, will encounter at least one mental health crisis a year. They say that's 43.8 million, million people. Moving forward, half of all, they say half of all mental disorders in that bunch begin at the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24. Uh, goes on to say in the U.S., only 41% uh, people with a disorder, disorder in the past year received professional health care or other services. These stats were pulled in a 2019 report uh, by the Mental Health First Aid Organization. Uh, in other words, if you don't get anything else that I'm saying here, what we're saying is mental health is real and it mandates our attention. Uh, again, this study was done in 2019, and so what we're seeing is as the generations progress, we are seeing that early and earlier, children and youth are dealing with mental health concerns. Uh, and what it means is not to say that the generations before didn't deal with them, we just didn't want to talk about it. Mm, don't get quiet on me now. Again, it's not that the baby boomers and those who are older didn't deal with mental health concerns as well, uh, but the thing is, they didn't want to talk about it. And now the younger generations are coming up, and they're not afraid to have these conversations. Uh, they're not afraid to talk about stress and anxiety, things that are going on. They're not afraid to go and see a counselor. But as we know, while there is definitely a necessity to go and talk to someone about your health concerns, whether they be physical, spiritual, or psychological, while it's good to go and sit in a couch or sit in the chair and talk to an earthen vessel to kind of get that out, we also must consider counselor Dr. Jesus. Oh, Y'all yeah, quiet on me. And so it's important to have help on the physical side, but it's also important to have help on the spiritual side as well. Uh, our text in Mark chapter 4 uh, deals with the Galilee crossing here in the text. And it's in this narrative, a great, we see a great tempest arose, and one could imagine the stress, anxiety, and fear that the disciples and everybody that was on that boat experienced. Here it is in Mark 4, Christ is giving several parables and he's giving the meaning of what those parables mean. And while he's telling them, let's go to, let's cross over to the other side, right in the middle of their crossing, mm -hmm. uh, we see a great storm arise. Now, if you follow the Sea of Galilee, uh, some scholars and those who are, are, are geographers, they'll say that the sea was about 13 miles long and about six miles wide. And so uh, they would say that when they were right in the middle of the sea, that's when the storm came. Also, if you follow the, the geographical location of the Sea of Galilee, it was a beautiful body of water, but it was surrounded by hills and mountains. And when you look at geography, anytime you have that, that is a cave or an area where storms typically would arise. Now, what we don't see in this text is that prior to the storm, prior to them crossing the Sea of Galilee, typically, because this is an area of such, one would see when the storm was coming. Mm -hmm. But the text suggests that uh, the nature of this storm, it was not one that anyone could see coming but Christ. Uh, the text suggests that when they got on the boat, there was not a cloud that was in sight. There was no indication that a storm was going to arise. But over when they got to the middle of the sea, that storm came out of nowhere. And isn't that just like life? You can be minding your own business and out of nowhere, storm tragedy hits you. Somebody close to you found out that they passed away. Uh, money you thought you had in your account, you checked it once, you checked it twice, checked it a third time, and your money that you thought was there, Lord have mercy, it ain't there. A bill that you had on auto pay you didn't know came and wiped out all your money. Crisis hit you. Yeah. The car you thought was stable got a warranty on it. You started for some reason it doesn't want to start up crisis hits and you're trying to figure out, Lord have mercy, what am I going to do? Tragedy has a way of hitting us out of nowhere. But the difference between tragedy and a test is that this particular storm 
did not come on through natural circumstances. This storm, one would suggest that Christ brought this storm to teach the disciples a lesson. And the same narrative exists for us today. Uh, yes, there are some storms that maybe are self-inflicted. There are some storms like the prophet Job where uh, uh, the enemy brings on these storms to, to plague us and corrupt our faith. But then there are some storms that are really a part of a test. And we have to decide as God's children, are we going to go through this test with God or are we going to try to make it on our own? Moving forward, the surface of this text teaches that Christ is concerned about your entire person. He's concerned about your mind. He's concerned about your body. And he's concerned about your soul. Yes, while the lives of all in this narrative were in great danger, their minds were greatly affected as well. And it's in this narrative that Christ emphasized the following. I got two points and I'll get out of your way. Christ emphasized number one, according to Mark 4 verse 35. Christ, we see the number one, Christ commanded the cross of somebody say commanded. Amen. Christ commanded the crossover. If you're tuning in online, type in that word crossover right here in verse 35 of the text. Uh, the Bible says, On the same day when evening had come, mm -hmm. he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Is that, is that in your Bibles? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, this is Christ speaking. Let us cross over to the other side. A couple of things we want to emphasize in this verse here. Number one, we want to consider the time of day. Uh, understand when you look at Jewish culture in their calendar, uh, they didn't have a 24-hour clock. They had what was called a 12-hour clock. And so their day started at, at 6 p.m. versus 12 a.m. That makes sense? And so they only had a 12-hour time period. And so again, when the Bible says, and, and when evening had come, it was getting ready to be the start of a new day. And so again, this storm, number one, they couldn't see it because it was dark. And so that's how life works. Uh, you can be minding your business, following the command. Again, it was commanded, let us cross over to the other side. And so the disciples were doing simply what their master commanded them. And so they cross over, and even though it's dark, they're there traveling over the Sea of Galilee, and right when we're transitioning from one day to the next, we see that a storm arose. And so we not only consider the time of day, then we must also consider uh, the command of Christ right here in the text in verse 35. It says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Side. Is that in your Bibles? Now, now, what I want you to get here, the point is really, really simple. Again, while we have the full picture of the story, we know that the story ends with Christ saying three words, and those three words are what? Peace be still. We know the narrative from start to finish. But what I want you to do is picture and put yourselves in the disposition of the disciples and everyone that was around Christ teaching these parables. Again, they're in the middle of the sea. They're crossing over the Sea of Galilee, and then a storm comes. But what we want to be mindful of in the position of the disciples is that, yes, while the storm came, we ought to be encouraged psychologically because Christ, it was a command, let us cross over to the other side. And what that means to us as children of God, yes, you're in the middle of life. Yes, storms come, but just as storms come, just like the seasons, they also pass. And so we've said in prior weeks that your storm, your adversity, it has an expiration date. Uh, as the song says, trouble don't last always. Yes, it may come for a while. Yes, the text says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And so I want to encourage the child of God today. I don't know where you are psychologically. I don't know what disposition you find yourself in. I don't know what storm you may be going through, but understand it's a storm, and every storm has a passageway through. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Uh, normally, as the saying in, in respect to history, it says, in history, if you don't know it, what you're bound to repeat it. 
And when you talk about sin, if you don't learn the lesson from sin or adversity, at some point, you will repeat that sin. You will repeat that storm. You will constantly go through a repeated cycle of the same storm over and over and over again. Why? Because if you don't learn the lesson or you don't go through your storms with God, God will continue to cycle you around and around and around until you get the lesson. Okay, let me give y'all scripture. Go back in the days of Israel when they were traveling from Egypt to the promised land. Right when they got to the bank of the promised land because the children of Israel were so stubborn. They were so sinful. Christ allowed them to wander in the wilderness. Not just one, two, or five, but he had them wander for 40 years. And sadly, that wandering... The only way that they would learn is if people died. And I believe, and I don't want to be insensitive to what's going on right now in this pandemic, but I believe we are in a a figurative wilderness where God is causing us to wonder and wonder and wonder and good people are dying. Why? Because God is trying to teach those of us who are still alive a lesson. And I believe until we get the lesson, until we learn, we will continue to wonder. Yeah, yeah. Preacher, how do you know that? If we learn the lesson, these variants wouldn't keep coming. And so God is saying they're not learning it yet, so let me bring another variant into this world to get their attention. And so God, through the storm, is asking the question, when are you going to learn? Just like the children of Israel, he promised them the promised land, but he didn't tell them the destination or the road would be easy. And the same case is happening for us. How many lives have to be lost until we get the lesson? How many lives have to be at the point of death in order for us to get what God is trying to teach us? Again, God said, Christ said in this verse, Let us cross over, and we will cross over. But there are lessons that we must learn in the midst of our crossing over. Moses, in Exodus 14, verse 13, he said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, which whom you see today, you shall see again. This is right when they were getting ready to cross over the Red Sea. They were afraid. They were terrified. Um, at, their, at the front, they were, uh, they were covered, uh, and they were blocked by the sea, the Red Sea. And at their back, they had the entire army of Egypt waiting to pounce and attack them. And understand, right before they crossed over, God, through Moses, made a promise. He said, what? The Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And life is just like that. God promised we're going to cross over. He already promised. We know that. God promised. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll always be with you even until the end of the age. Amen. God promised that whatever we go through, he'll be with us. But the question is not will God be with you? The question is will you be with God? Is that all right? And so number one, not only do we see uh, uh, the, that Christ commanded the crossover, uh, uh, secondly, in the text, uh, we see, according to Mark 4, verse 39, we see that Christ calmed the chaos. Somebody say calmed. Again, Christ calmed the chaos. If you're tuning in online, type in that word calm right here in verse 39 of the text. The Bible says, then he, talking about Christ, after they woke him up, he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, what? Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And the Bible says, and there was a great calm. Is, it, is, that, is that in your Bibles? Here it is. Christ, he told them to get on the boat and let us cross over to the, to the other side. And as they were crossing this 13-mile body of water, right there when they got in the middle Between 13 miles long and six miles wide, a storm came out of nowhere. Storm came. The text says that uh, they were troubled. They became fearful. 
You can imagine, again, if you put yourself in their disposition, you can imagine how terrified and fearful you would be. Yes, these are the apostles. Yes, these are the men that Christ handpicked and chose uh, to lead the charge after he would ascend to glory and prepare a place for us. But still, as humans, that does not uh, dissolve us from fear, from anxiety, from stress. I want you to know, as a child of God, as a human, uh, you're not lesser or weaker because you have mental issues. You're not crazy because you have stress and anxiety. These are normal things that normal people face. Uh, the challenge is that the generations that have come along, we've just found a nice word to call it. It's bigger than a headache, it's stress. It's bigger than I'm tired or I'm weary, it's anxiety. And that is what normal people who deal with life, that's what they face. Every single, I don't care how long you've been in the church, I don't care how strong your faith is, because you're human, you will deal with stress. You will deal with anxiety. You will be uh, plagued by worry and concern. That's a part of not just being a Christian. That's a part of being human. Right. Yeah. Why, why do we deal with that? Why? Because as humans, we are ignorant and we don't know everything. The thing is, God doesn't have to stress. Why? Because he knows the outcome. Well. But the encouraging factor is that even though they were stressed even though they were concerned with the storm. They had no fear. Why? Because Christ was right there in the boat with them. Christ, yeah, yeah, Thaddeus gets it. Yeah, he, he knows when to shout. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, again, they were fearful. They were afraid. Yes, their faith was lacking, but they still had enough sense to know who to turn to and where to go. And so, as a child of God, when you get stressed out, when you get worrisome, when you have anxiety, know that you shouldn't turn to yourself because the answer to your storms is not in you, but the answer to your problems is right there with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, again, in verse 37, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat started to fill up. Verse 38, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. <laughs> Here it is, a major storm is going on outside the boat. Everybody on that boat is panicking. Everybody on the seashore is panicking. Everybody, again, consider the text said this was not the only boat that was in the sea. So everybody that was in the sea was panicking, considering, and asking, what is going on? Are we going to die? And so then when they came to get Christ, they probably had in their minds that Christ was up already getting ready to do something about their situation. But when they went into the boat, they found that Christ was not awake, but Christ was sleeping. In other words, Christ was unbothered by the storm. I don't miss that. Uh, uh, that term unbothered, of course, in, in, in the African-American vernacular, that's a term of I'm not worried about it, I ain't stressed about it, I, I'm not concerned about it. Why? Because I already know the outcome. And some would say, well, yes, preacher, it's easy for God to be unbothered. Why? Because he has the power over the storm. But the lesson is that we are called to learn it's even though we don't have the power to stop the storm, we have the power to pray and have a relationship with the one that has the power to stop said storm. So yes, you may not know how it all is going to work out, but we know that it is going to work out because we worship the one who works all things together for our good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Christ was sleeping. Christ was unbothered by the storm. Christ was not concerned by the storm. And so as a child of God, really, what we must learn to do is be like God. Again, we said it last week, when we are talking about storms and anxiety and worry, it's a real, a real test of being unbothered, of not being worried or stressed. It's not when nothing is going on in your life. It's not the absence of storms. It's not the absence of adversity. But a, a person that is really unbothered is when adversity is actually all around them, 
but they had the mental strength and stability to put a shield around themselves. We saw last week in Philippians uh, uh, chapter number four, uh, uh, verse seven, it says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts. Again, we'll be mindful. That term peace and that narrative and even the peace that Christ provides here in Mark chapter number four is like a guard that shields you and protects you. And so again, being a child of God is not about being uh, absolved or, or the absence of storms or struggles or adversity, but it's being right in the middle of your storm, but having the peace of Christ, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Yeah. Yeah. They said in verse 38, they woke him up, Christ, not only are we getting ready to die, but God, you're getting ready to die. That's how afraid they were. Uh, they said the storm is not just too powerful for us, but God, the storm is, you, you can't even stop it. Mm. <laughs> Woke him up with concern in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he, verse 39, arose and rebuked the wind yeah. and said to the sea, mm -hmm. peace, be still. That term peace in the original language means to keep silent. He told the raging winds mm -hmm. and the waves and the storm to shut up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as he stopped speaking, watch this now, verse 39. It says, and the wind ceased. <laughs> and there was a great calm. That term ceased in the original language means to tire or relax. In other words, when Christ spoke, the wind got tired. Mm. Mm, don't miss yeah. that. Yeah. When God said, peace be still, mm -hmm. uh, the, the wind had no choice but to obey the command of its creator. In order to appreciate Christ and his command over the elements, you have to go back to Genesis 1 to realize that God was the one that created the elements. Uh, he created the land and he created the sea. He also created the winds and he put them in their perspective places. So in other words, uh, yes, he told them in verse 35, let us cross over to the other side. Why? Because again, there was a lesson that he was trying to teach them. And so when they got to the middle of the sea, God allowed the four winds to come out of their places and they began to blow and he allowed the rains to come and flood. And so, so much so that it became unnatural. It became a thing. This was not a normal storm that you see. Yeah. This was not a simple rainfall that you see and say, okay, well, it's raining. That's good. We have a drought. The land needs water. No, this was a dangerous storm that was uh, paralyzing their faith, and it was getting ready to destroy their boat. Yeah. 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 So much so that, again, Keep in mind, three of these 12 were fishermen. So they've seen a storm or two. So this is not a normal storm. This is a storm that is unused. This is a storm that is peculiar, so peculiar that they had to go and wake up Christ. Came and reminded through his actions and his power that the same God that said, let there be light is standing right here before you. And if he can calm the winds and the waves of life, can he not calm the winds and the waves in your mind? Again, we said last week, there are certain times in the mind that the mind, if it's uninformed, it will create scenarios that are not real. They thought on their heads they were going to die. But the thought is that if they were going to die, that meant that Christ would have to die. It says, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
But then after he calmed the elements, he said, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? The Bible says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Keep in mind, the people that are asking this question, they're not foreigners. These are not people that were unfamiliar with God and who he was. But it just shows to believe that how much storms can paralyze our faith. A storm can come so heavy in your life that it can cause you to be spiritually ignorant, that you forget who God is and how powerful he is. Again, prior to this point, they heard him teach awesome dynamic lessons. They saw him perform several miracles prior to, but it was something about this storm. It was something about this issue. It was something about this concern that caused them to be spiritually paralyzed, caused them to have spiritual amnesia, caused them uh, uh, to have spiritual Alzheimer's that caused them to forget. It's not that they didn't know who God was, but the storm caused them to forget who God was. And every now and again in life, a storm will come so big, it'll cause us to forget who God is and who God has already proven himself to be. And so Christ, like Jay-Z said, allow me to reintroduce myself. had to remind not just the 12, but everybody, the entire multitude that was around who he was. He's not just a God that can feed you. He's not just a God that can heal you, but he's also a God that can protect you. We said before, yes, it is wise to wear a mask. It is wise to take care of your body. It is wise to exercise. It is wise to take precaution. But the care is not through your actions. The care is through God's provision. Right. And so Christ had to remind them, and he has to remind us, I am not the God of some, but I am the God of all. There's nothing that God cannot do. There's nothing that God has not seen. There's nothing that God cannot help you come through. I love scripture because scripture has a way of aligning itself spiritually. Uh, give me the next slide, Brother Nate. In order to appreciate what Christ did here, we have to look at the prophet Jonah, verse 11 and 12. The Bible says there, uh, then they said to him, and this is the people that, if you know the story of, of Jonah, Jonah was uh, called and commissioned to go preach to Nineveh. He chose to do uh, elsewise chose to do otherwise rather, and he began to travel in the opposite direction of Nineveh. But there's a lesson here. And so while he was on the ship, the people that were on board with him, much like the narrative here in Mark 4, a great storm came that was unnatural. Storm came, and so the, they said to him, in verse 11, they said, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous, and he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that the great tempest is because of me. Yeah. Now, there are a few similarities in this narrative when you compare Jonah 1 to Mark 4, but there are also a few differences as well. What are some of the differences? Number one, uh, with the similarities, number, number one, both Jonah and Jesus were the cause of the storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jonah's cause of the storm was because of disobedience and sin. Yeah. Christ's cause for the storm was a valuable lesson that he was trying to teach. Uh, in similar fashion, both through their actions had the power and they were the literal remedy for the storm. Yeah. Again, Jonah's life was the remedy for the storm. Yes, he sinned, but the beauty of Jonah is not that he sinned, but the fact that he was willing to die for his sins. Don't miss that. 
even though Jonah sinned, Christ began to work through his repentant spirit because he knew that everybody, if he didn't throw himself overboard, everybody on the ship was going to die. And so Christ, much like Jonah, Christ understood that if I don't do something about the storm, if I don't calm the wind and I don't calm the sea, everybody on the ship is going to die. And so the storm that the world was facing was, was bigger than winds. It was bigger than waves. Everybody, regardless of your age, regardless of your status, regardless of your race, everybody deals with the storm of sin. And much like Jonah, Christ knew in his mind that if I don't die, the world would die of its sin. And so Christ, unselfishly, Christ was willing to get up and say, peace be still, not just with his words, but he said, peace be still with his own life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read somewhere in scripture, Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Christ said elsewhere that if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it back up. Just like Jonah, when he went into the body of water, he went into that great fish. He was there not one day, not two days, but he was there for three days. Christ went into the belly of the earth, stayed there not one day, not two days, but on the third day, Christ rose with our power. In his hands. Yeah, yeah, I know that's right. And so Christ, when he rose, that was a great declaration with his life that when the enemy put him in the ground, they forgot that he was a great seed that was going to sprout and be life abundantly for everybody that would hear and abide by his will. And so Christ, with his life, with his death, his burial, and his his resurrection, I can see him in the Great Commission, much like the disciples, how they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They were the same way uh, in the upper room, waiting on God. I dare say they weren't even waiting on God. They were there hiding because if they said if, we, if they kill Christ, they're surely going to kill us. Yeah. Preacher, how do you know they, were, they weren't being faithful? Why? Because the doors were secure. Yeah. They, they locked themselves up yeah. in this room. Yeah. Christ showing his power yeah. into the room with number one without knocking, into yeah. yeah. the room without even opening the door. And what's the first thing he said to them? Do not be afraid. Peace be unto you. Gave them peace. Reassured them. Christ, with his death, burial, and resurrection, reassured us that if I can tackle the greatest storm you'll ever face called sin, I can handle a pandemic. I can handle your stress. I can handle your anxiety. I can handle your worries. I can handle your money. I can handle your health. I can handle your marriage. I can handle your family. I can handle your kids being at school. There's nothing that I can't handle in your life. Why? Because Christ said, I am life. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That's what he said. And so because we know God, we can be unbothered by life. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be stressed out. Words is what be anxious for nothing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we know God. And the beauty is, not only do do we know God, the important thing is that God knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you ever been in a relationship where, you know, you love somebody more than they love you? Mm. Ain't nothing worse than that. But Christ is saying, I, I know you claim me, but better than you claiming me, I claim you. Why is Christ claiming us more important? Because Christ said in Matthew, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter. So anybody can claim God, but it's not you claiming God, it's God claiming you. And so I pray that through our lives, I pray that through our faith, that we learn to be unbothered by life. And that's not saying that life will never get to you because it is. Life even got to Christ when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
but Christ, even in his physical weakness, showed us how we must allow the Spirit of God to overpower our earthly limitations. Listen to the flesh. Father, if it's possible, what, let this cup pass from me. But now listen to the Spirit. Not my will, but let your will be done. Christ showed us, even when in your deepest, darkest, and the thing is, Christ knew he was going to die the whole time. But it still stressed him out. And what was it? The stress was not him physically dying, but it was him spiritually dying. Up until that point, Christ was never separated from the Godhead. Never. He was always in fellowship and in perfect alignment and harmony with the God. But when, when he got to the point when he was put on the cross, that's why God was silent. That's why the Spirit was done. That's why the earth became dark. Why? Because Christ had the sins of the entire world on his shoulders. And the prophet speaks truthfully in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, what? Because sin separates us from God. That's what stressed Christ out the most was the idea, just the idea of not being in fellowship with his father. And if Christ was fearful and he did nothing wrong, where should we be? We talk about sin. And we're actually guilty. We, we actually did it. We actually, we're actually wrong. And so we ought to model that behavior. What's the takeaway? Come on, Nate, give me the last one. Uh, number one, when Christ makes a command, know in your heart, it shall stand. What did he was trying to say? By two immutable things, it's what? Impossible for God to lie. Mm -hmm. God has made so many promises to us. And when God makes a promise, know in your heart, it shall stand. Lastly, your chaos is a teachable moment from Christ. Yeah, I know there are some storms that are self-inflicted. There are some storms, like, again, like the prophet Job, that God allows the enemy to bring to us. But then there are some storms that God brings, God himself brings to teach us. How do you know that, preacher? Look at Matthew 4. Christ was tempted. He was led into the wilderness, what? By the Spirit. God tempted God. So if God will tempt himself, I mean, oh God, not tempt, rather, if God will test, rather, let me correct myself. God tested God. So if God tested himself, <laughs> know that you and I, we will experience much of the same. Let's enjoy us. Come on, come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. As I said last week, closing out, I don't know what thought is in your mind, but because the mind is always thinking and processing, I know something is on your mind right now. This is the Lord's invitation. God is calling to you to renew your relationship with him. I don't, I don't know what last week brought you away. I don't know what transgressions you have in your life. But if you do, this is the time that God is calling you to get it right with him. You need prayer, you need encouragement, you're falling from grace. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Not a member of the body of Christ. God is calling you to fix your life with him. And that happens through salvation, through the act of baptism. Romans 6 and 4 says that just as Christ was buried, we are buried with him through baptism, and we rise a new creature in Christ. Baptism is an act of faith. It is an outward showing of inward faith. Coming to God just as you are, not trying to fix yourself because, honestly, you don't have the power to fix yourself. I don't care how nice you look. None of us have the power to fix the issue of sin. We've been trying for a long time, and we failed every single time. Christ, knowing that, Christ was willing and ready to do something about our situation. Died for you so that you could have a right to the tree of life. Must come into him as a believer. Hebrews said, he that comes to God must believe, number one, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who would diligently seek him. Have a repentant spirit. Put him on in baptism. Put you in the family. It gives you access to all that God is and all that God has for you. What's your desire? How you respond? Come on now while we sing a song of invitation. Come on, come on.